Oh, hello! Welcome to Dorothy Stringer, our butterfly haven in fact. Boy, do we have a story to tell you. A 25 year story about education and the environment. But guys, where's our manners? Perhaps we should be introducing ourselves first. Okay. I'm Matt. I'm Elka. I'm Rio and I've decided to help do this project because I love butterflies. So, let's go back to where our story begins. Yeah, and that seems like such a long time ago. Well, as so many of us know now, it's not easy to plan during a pandemic. And so our presentation has had to adapt a little from the epic outdoors address we had envisioned to this Zoom and PowerPoint confined effort. We know butterflies are a good indicator of a healthy ecosystem, but they're also an indicator of many other things. Humans have always been drawn to the bright and colorful. These beautiful insects capture our hearts and are an indicator of our innate, but often ignored, connection with the natural world. They're an indicator of how the delights of nature can still grab someone's attention and imagination in a world of relentless high-tech media and gaming imagery. They're an indicator of how fragile life can be, an indicator of our dependence on the same ecosystem services that serve them, an indicator of how all of our lives are temporary on this earth and an indicator of how, given a chance, nature can rebound, and rebound in abundance. An abundance we can only often read about in natural history diaries from the past. Dorothy Stringer School, a state comprehensive in Brighton, has been pushing the environmental agenda for over 25 years, and I've been lucky enough to work there with Dan Danahar for over 20 years. During that time, We've been equally lucky to work with thousands of amazing students like Rio, Elka and Matthew, who you've already met. One of the earliest things we did was convert a derelict building into our environment centre. After the formal opening, the building very quickly became the heart of environmental education within our school community. Inclusivity has been at the centre of what we do. We've tried to work with as many different people and organisations as we can. It may seem hard for people to understand in this digital age, but one way by which we began to engage with that community was to regularly print 2,000 copies of our green pages. And this is how we got our story out. The green pages informed people about how we aim to provide biodiversity education for all. But inadvertently, our story became more about how butterflies could be agents for change in our school and beyond. Hi, Rio here. Very early on, we decided to develop and enhance the outdoor resources for teaching and learning within our programme of biodiversity education. To start with, Dorothy Stringer School shares a 28 hectare Surrounding campus with five other educational institutions. And we're the lucky ones who have the fragment of 400 year old woodland on our part of the campus. On our woodland working days, students, teachers, parents, governors, and neighbors all help manage the site. We've learned how to coppice trees and so understand why this can increase biodiversity by opening up the woodland, creating a patchwork of microclimates which encourage a range of species, including butterflies. Our city has 19,000 elm trees in it, and elm is the host plant for the white letter hair street butterfly. Subsequently, over the last 20 years, we've been managing our woodland with this butterfly in mind. And in 2018, we were delighted when a colony finally established itself in the school's woodland. Working with all these different people means that interests and skills are shared. One of our parents, who was a cabinet maker, was also interested in birds. So soon we found our woodland populated with bird boxes. Before I was born, our school received a grant of £10,000 from Barclays Bank to build an educational pond in the school grounds. This application also included a programme of biodiversity education workshops for local primary schools so that their pupils could explore our outdoor resources at Dorothy Stringer and therefore have a direct exposure to nature. So if you want to cement a community together, here's what you do. You find 50 volunteers to move six tonnes of concrete in two hours. 
the pond is now a key feature of our science, geography and environmental science lessons, as well as for visiting primary schools. It's provided a great source of joy to thousands of children who have had access to it. The resources we've created on site enable our secondary school students to work with the pupils from local primary school when they visit in the summer for their biodiversity workshops. We get to be group leaders and teach the primary pupils about the wildlife we find in our school grounds. We are very lucky to live in a part of the world which has lots of wildlife for us to explore. Our school has taken thousands of students over the years out onto the South Downs, to the coast and onto the Weald. We have some very rare and wonderful species on our doorstep that many other children in the UK do not get an opportunity to see. For example, the Adonis and small blue butterflies or the burnt tip and spider orchids. For 11 years, our school taught GCSE environmental science. This was fantastic because the students learned a lot about the environment, but also gained a qualification in this subject. Sadly, this qualification was scrapped by Mr Cameron's greenest ever government. As you can see, it involved a lot of lessons outside the classroom. Luckily, our school recognised the value of this course and the expertise of our teachers and the resources we've developed on the school grounds. So, in its place, we now provide environmental science for all 320 Year 7 students. I feel really lucky to be at Dorothy Stringer School because as far as we know, no other school gives Year 7 students the opportunity to explore, study and connect with the natural world in the way our school does. We got to plant trees and learn to identify and monitor birds, bees, butterflies and a variety of plants. As a consequence, we all got more bioliterate, bionumerate and bioempathic. As the demands for more and more biodiversity education became apparent, so it became equally obvious that it would be unsustainable to take all 1,700 children from the schools to the countryside. So instead, we decided to bring the countryside to us. In 1994, a group of butterfly scientists wrote a paper about how the shape of an anthill affects the microclimate. In effect, by building their nest in a certain way, the sun rays can heat it up, and so the ant's metabolism can be given a kickstart. These very same scientists suggested that this approach could be applied to chalk landscapes and so provided surrogate habitats for rare diamond butterflies. So we applied for £10,000 to the Breeding Places scheme run by the National Lottery and the BBC. We knew that many schools would be applying for the money to plant woodlands or dig ponds, but we didn't think that that many schools would apply for funds to topographically modify chalk landscapes to manipulate microclimate at ground level to support early successional chalk grassland butterfly species. They didn't, and we got the funding. The majority of the sward on the Sarandon campus is used for physical education, for example, football or rugby. So it's amenity or municipal grassland. We found that this area contained just 10 wildflower species. These photos show the area both before and after the plant machinery had done its work on an area of land just half the size of a modern football pitch. The right hand image shows three differently sized linear banks designed to show variation in size because we did not know what, si what impact size would have on the work we were undertaking. We were fortunate to work with John Gapper, who for 45 years has been growing wildflowers of, six of local provenance. He has to grow his entire seed store every year because unlike the native seed bank at Wakehurst, he has nowhere to store them. John supplied all plants as bare-rooted so that we minimalised the alien soil we were introducing to the site. So the roots of the plants had to work hard to penetrate the soil within the first couple of days after planting. This produced a 95% success rate without the need for watering. All 1700 of my fellow students at Dorothy Stringer participated in planting up this first butterfly haven. After 18 months, as can be seen here, diversity in the original municipal amenity grassland is visibly lower than on the same land after habitat restoration had taken place. But don't take my word for it. See what the late Liz Williams, botanist, who we later named the Butterfly Haven after, and Peter Hodge, entomologist, had to say. Liz Williams found an order of magnitude increase the floristic diversity of the site. With these results, this project became overnight not just about increasing awareness of biodiversity loss, but about actually increasing biodiversity. Peter equally revealed that we were creating good quality habitat for the other rather obscure invertebrates. For example, from top left to bottom right, a nationally scarce ground bug specialising in bare ground habitats. A picture winged fly first discovered in the UK in 2005. A local shield bug in the toad flax brocade, a species of moth that has its own biodiversity action plan. And this is the face that your teacher makes when one of our target species is found overpositing 
on the host plant that we had deliberately provided. In some senses, the Liz William Butterfly Haven was looking like a pictorial meadow when the late Professor David Bellamy and Nick Baker arrived to work with us. 30 species of butterfly, that's 81% of all the butterflies we have recorded in our home city of Brighton and Hope, have been recorded from the half football pitch sized Liz Williams Butterfly Haven. When I hear about biodiversity loss in the media, my experience at school tells me that humanity can turn things around, it's just a matter of priorities. So we advise the Brighton Hove Parks Department and the city planners about our approaches to habitat restoration. And now the Parks Department have created over 25 butterfly havens around the city. And so Dr. Dan Hart nominated them for the Marsh Christian Award. Finally, to raise people's awareness of the importance of ecosystem services, we urge the public to count butterflies in our very own big biodiversity butterfly camp. Martin Warren, then CEO of the National Charity Butterfly Conservation, was so impressed by our efforts that inspired the charity to take this idea to the national audience, something that you now know of as the Big Butterfly Camp. Hi, Matt Nash. Whilst we were developing our local work, opportunities to work internationally started to present themselves. Firstly, we were awarded the Franco-British Council Award twice. This we collected from the Palace of Westminster, and this was a great opportunity for us to meet the Environment Minister of the time, Elliot Morley. In this environmental exchange, students from Le Havre, France and Brighton, England, explored the cultural significance of our respective countries' as natural heritage. And in the process, we developed a long lasting partnership between our two communities. To do this, we frequently visited Normandy and in return played host to our French counterparts here in Sussex. Using a graphics led field guide developed in house, students learn about habitat recognition and the ecological techniques used to explore them. Whilst each party did translate their field guides, it became evident that working in a different language provided intriguing insights into the values associated with the natural world by each nation, and it certainly developed a very real sense of entente cordiale. In 2008, an opportunity arose to develop a lasting relationship with the community of Okosomo, Ghana, West Africa, and students have been travelling annually ever since, whilst Ghanaian visits to the UK have been a little more intermittent. Here was an opportunity to explore biodiversity education in an entirely new context. And so once again, we used butterfly species diversity as a means by which we could talk more broadly about biodiversity and ecosystem services. Butterfly nets are pretty universally frowned upon these days, but we've found that they made the invisible visible for so many students. For days afterwards, students would point out butterflies after they had used their nets in ways they wouldn't have done before. Butterflies are also really great social connectors. Few individuals dislike butterflies, and as we worked together, we developed a very real sense of camaraderie. However, butterflies were just the beginning. We decided to compare energy consumption between our two communities and found that in an average student bedroom here in Brighton, we might have up to 30 electrical appliances, whilst our Ghanaian counterparts might not have a bedroom at all. So, over the years, we have supported the education of individual students, helped with the provision of educational resources, and provided funds to aid the building of new classrooms and a gap year centre in the Cosimo. As many will remember, 2010 was the International Year of Biodiversity, and during this time, we led a loose association of organisations and called ourselves Big Nature as a synonym for biodiversity. This is because biodiversity was a word that many primary school children didn't understand. Our objective was to raise awareness of global biodiversity loss. And to do this, we put on a series of monthly environmental events for the citizens of Brighton and Hove. For example, one of the events we put on during the May of 2010 was the Be Aware campaign, where we produced 20,000 identification guides in English and French. And working with our old partners in La Havre, we encourage people living in both cities to record online the common bee species they found in their respective cities. All the monthly events could be seen on our Big Nature website. And one of our final events was the Big Nature Conference, which took place at Dorothy Stringer School during the November of 2010. We invited the CEO of Brighton and Hove City Council, John Baradell, to chair the conference, and he brought along some councillors. So impressed were those councillors by the overwhelming interest in biodiversity that when the need to fund an officer to write a bid to apply for the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve status was raised, the council agreed to that funding. And in 2014, UNESCO designated the Brighton and Lewis Downs Biosphere Reserve, now the Living Coast. 
Of course, to further interest in this newly designated region, we again turn to butterflies. Writing about butterflies of the biosphere, setting up Facebook groups for butterflies of the biosphere, and even making YouTube videos about butterflies of the biosphere. Because we wanted people to explore a familiar area with new interests. We even printed 27,000 posters of the butterflies of the biosphere. And the idea here was that if you see a butterfly in the biosphere, then it will be on the poster. No need for a book. Finally, we promoted a bookend year to the International Decade of Biodiversity and called it Nature 2020. This planned for a range of events mirroring those that had been undertaken in 2010. What happened to Big Nature? Well, it became a charitable company with the aim of promoting habitat restoration within the biosphere. The concept here was that if you create a wildflower lawn or wildlife pond in your garden, the very next day you'll be out looking for germinating seeds in your lawn or frogs in your pond thus raising awareness and interest in local biodiversity, whilst also increasing good quality habitats in the urban setting. It's a great way to end the day. Yeah. Mm. Dorothy Stringer has done a lot of outreach work over the last 25 years, and this is a great example. Because we've learned that all successful nature conservation is about partnership. Big Nature has helped Wildflower Lewis plant wildflowers. We, Leslie and I went up to Wakehurst place, you know, Q Wakehurst, and collected over a thousand plug plants a couple of weeks ago. And we um, had nine verges in the town, which we are going to plant those, those plug plants in. We put flyers into people's doors so that they knew what was going to be happening outside their house. And on one occasion up in Morling, we had 12 people turned up to help us. Another occasion down um, down the Brighton Road sort of area. I think it, actually, I think it was the Neville Road out here. 22 people were there planting. So the word is spreading. People are getting the message and understanding why we want wildflowers in the birches. When Big Nature found out about the project that Wildflower Lewis were doing all around their city, we knew that this was something that we had to support. And uh, it really is exciting that they're getting local people out involved in planting wildflowers in their local area, connecting people with the local nature on their doorstep. The most practical, direct thing that you can do and really inspiring and exciting project. After pushing the biodiversity education agenda for 22 years at Dorothy Stringer and within my adopted home city of Brighton and Hove, I've just retired, this February in fact. And whilst I look back and find myself astonished and immensely proud by what we've achieved during that time, I can't help thinking about a conversation I had with my tutor, Bill Scott, at the University of Bath where I undertook my environmental science PGCE way back in 1988. Bill said to me, Dan, you'll be lucky if you end up teaching environmental science. In most cases, postgraduates from this course end up teaching science and will have to try their best to promote environmental education from there. Well, you know, I became evangelical about what I started to call biodiversity education. And by the end of my career, I expected there to be environmental education specialists of one sort or another in every school in the land. But sadly, this is not the case. The simple truth is that whilst we've achieved an incredible amount in Brighton and Hove, this has all been done despite and not because of government policies. In fact, today we can't even assume that trainee teachers understand about Nature Deficit Disorder, NDD, because many of them have had a nature poor education themselves. Indeed, you may be starting to think that this is a bit of a negative way to end a talk at an Earth Optimism event. So let me tell you why I still remain optimistic. It's the young people's climate change marches, which are the reason why I remain filled with optimism. After teaching about the environment for two decades, it's like watching a sleeping giant suddenly awaken. They're campaigning in relation to climate change and the ecological crisis, and I think it's really important that these two continue to be linked. Furthermore, students are protesting about both the lack of effective government action and the lack of effective education within schools. These are both new phenomena. So having spent so much time over my career thinking about these issues, I believe it's really positive to distill some clear goals for the future based on what we've learned from our experiences in the past. Our children should be entitled to expert teachers fully trained in all forms of environmental, sustainable and biodiversity education 
a government commissioned review into how the whole of the English formal education system is preparing students for the climate emergency and ecological crisis. Resources in all school grounds to allow children direct access to rich and diverse nature on their doorsteps. And a justifiable belief that their futures will be bright. Thank you very much.